So ladies and gentlemen, please give a more, very warm Florida welcome to my very good friend, David Axelrod. Uh, I cannot begin without returning the compliment because when this guy arrived uh, and was assigned to me at City Hall, it was immediately apparent that this was a natural born newsman. And, um, and he was an outstanding reporter. He became an outstanding editor. And uh, I'm really gratified and thrilled that he's here now trying to impart those values uh, that make a good journalist uh, to a new generation of journalists around the world. So congratulations to you Thank on you. that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you so much. It's also, by the way, it's also good to be in a room full of opinionated people. So. <laughs> How much do I owe you for that, by the way? <laughs> Uh, so, David, I, I think what most people want to know here tonight is, uh, are we going to see the mustache again? No, we're not. <clears throat> you know how, I mean, some of you may know how I lost the mustache, but, um, you know, I was on, it actually began at the end of the 2012 campaign. I was on Morning Joe, and Joe Scarborough, having been filled with uh, erroneous polling data by the Republicans, <laughs> said, you're in trouble in, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, and Minnesota. And you can't win the presidency without those states. And I said, we're not in trouble in those states. We're going to win those states. And I said, Joe, uh, and he's like, and soon I said, Joe, if we lose those states, I will shave off my mustache of 40 years right on your show. And I said, but if we win your home state of Florida, then you have to grow one. <laughs> and so we, of course, won our, all of those three states. And thank you, the state of Florida. And uh, the next morning, yeah, give yourselves a hand. <laughs> next morning, I go on morning. Uh, next morning, I actually get a call from Joe and Mika. And Mika says, Joe's too embarrassed to speak. Mika says, Joe, Joe, Joe can't grow a mustache. This, uh, <laughs> this can't happen. And so we have to find a way out of here. And they say, well, he wants to donate $10,000 to your wife's Epilepsy Research Foundation, Epilepsy really um, is the defining, a defining presence in our lives because it, uh, my daughter started having seizures when she was seven months old and didn't stop for 19 years. And um, it was a terribly difficult thing. And my wife, out of grief and anger, uh, started a, a research foundation that's now the largest private funder of epilepsy research in the world. But uh, so she, uh, she, I tell her they want to give me $10,000 for a cure, she said, it's not enough. <laughs> she said, you go back and you tell Joe that he will, that you will still shave your mustache off at the end of November if we can raise a million dollars for epilepsy research. So I go back, dutifully, and I do it. Uh, and, um, and we ended up raising $1.2 million. And by the way, one of the donors, one of the major donors, was Mr. Donald J. Trump. I want you to know that. He was on, he was, no, this is absolutely true, he was on, uh, on, on the show, or I, but I, I basically said, you know, uh, Trump had made some, five, he tried to make a $5 million bet with the president that the president ta didn't take. I said, we saved him $5 million. <laughs> so the least he can do is give me some of that for this. And he sent a check for $100,000, which I then took to Mark Cuban and said, you can't let Donald Trump. <laughs> can't tell so he sent 200000 <laughs> So at the end of it, um, uh, at the, we, we come to the day, simulcast on the Today Show and Morning Joe, there's a barber there, a professional barber shaving me on national TV named Steve. Uh, subtext of this is Steve, we're, ha we're right in the middle of this, and he cut me. And I'm like bleeding. And after this, I said, Steve, you're a professional. What? He said, yeah, man, but I never did this on TV before. <laughs> and so uh, the shaving is done. We get about 10 steps away, and my wife says, you know, I always hated that thing anyway. <laughs> 33 years we were married, she never said a word. 
So she said, so don't grow it back. So I'm under strict uh, orders not to grow it back. Okay. I, I like the no mustache look. It took a little while to get used to, but uh, it looks for good. me too. Yeah. It also adds a little time to each day, you know, to preparations. Right. But um, I, well, now I look at myself with the mustache and I think, how absurd that was. <laughs> It's like, I, I look like a walrus. <laughs> so, so, uh, so another thing I, ha I have to ask you is, is today you should know David started his morning very early in Boston. Uh, he had some meetings at Harvard and uh, flew commercial uh, from Boston to Newark. That's uh, pretty and much then, how I fly. And, and then, well, that's getting to my point. And, and down, down here to uh, Tampa. And then he had the misfortune of riding with me in the car uh, over here tonight. So... I guess my question is, do you miss riding on Air Force One and, uh, and riding the presidential motorcade? You know, uh, that was very convenient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, um, it was an incredible experience to uh, serve um, every single day. I'm, I'm someone who, I revere politics, I revere history. And I was always aware when I walked in that building every single day that I was walking into this extraordinary place, sort of the nerve center of, of America and the world. And it was, you know, and, you know, every ride in Air Force One was, um, you know, I, I didn't, it didn't lose its uh, novelty. But I will tell you that um, the, the flip side of it is um, working in the White House is like working in a submarine. You kind of, you're, you're there all the time and you look at America through a periscope. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I always stayed in Chicago when I was a political consultant, I mean, the main reason was I love Chicago. My wife was from Chicago, it's a great town. But I also felt like I was better at what I did because I lived where people, you know, didn't talk about the Federal Register over dinner. <laughs> and, um, and so one of the hard things about being in the White House was um, you kind of lose your feel. I used to convene a meeting of a bunch of the strategists and consultants who worked on our campaign every Wednesday night at my apartment. The president said it was just a, because I liked uh, the Thai food that we ordered and <laughs> said it was an excuse to eat Thai food. But it really was, a, a, uh, it was an attempt on my part to, um, to try and keep in touch with what was going out on uh, outside, and I think that's a great challenge for anybody um, in in the White House. Right. Oh, we're going to circle back to your White House days in a second, but but one other question I felt like I had to ask, and I've been dying to ask you this. So, you and I uh, both covered politics in Chicago. Uh, we both worked in Washington, and uh, I'm really curious which town you think plays more hardball, uh, Chicago or or Washington, and. And when I think of Chicago politics, I think back to an old shoe comic strip. Uh, the, you all remember the shoe uh, comic strip? So uh, Jeff McNally, another former colleague of ours at the Chicago Tribune, did that comic strip. And, and one of them was uh, depicted a Chicago uh, uh, city council race. And, and uh, it was a candidate holding up a sign. And it said, vote for Rody and you don't get hurt. And I, and, I, and I think that that sort of typifies uh, Chicago politics. Um, but so, so which, which you, town... You should explain, though, just to give some coloration to the joke, was that Fred Rohde was from the first ward in Chicago, which was a notorious mob right. ward, and his father right. was named Bruno the Bomber Rohde. Right. <laughs> he was not a physicist. Right. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, you know, th there's that element of Chicago politics that I know people, uh, you know, you, you, there's much, it's really not that way uh, today. But the thing that I appreciate about Chicago and Chicago politics is its, it's bluntness. I mean, you know, if people are going to screw you, they tell you to your face. <laughs> and um, everybody is very transparent about what their, uh, what their, their skin in the game is. And uh, I'm always, uh, I always think about my friend David Wilhelm. Some of you may remember, he was the campaign manager for Bill Clinton in 1992. And David, had, he was, worked with me on the Paul Simon campaign. He was Rich Daly's campaign manager in 1989. Uh, really good guy. And after they won, he was appointed chairman of the Democratic National Committee. And as you'll remember, they had a catastrophic midterm election in 1994, something I can relate to.
And, um, and uh, David was uh, summarily dismissed as head of the DNC. And they said, where are you going now? And he said, I'm going back to Chicago where at least they stab you in the front. <laughs> you know, in Washington, I think they knife you, but they have velvet knives. You know, they're a, they're a little more you know, sophisticated I, I mean, about in, it there. In all seriousness, um, I, I have a lot of friends in Washington. It was, a, it was an interesting place to work. But there is a pathology to the town. I mean, first of all, it is completely consumed by politics. Secondly, it's filled with very bright, very ambitious people who often certify their own importance by, you know, trying to kneecap someone else. It's like who gets in the meeting and who doesn't get in the meeting and, you know, and all that stuff. And, and I find that tiresome. I, I, it's unhealthy. So when I was in Chicago, I always called myself, a, in Washington, I always called myself a Chicagoan on assignment. Yeah. Good. Well, you did pretty well on assignment there. Yeah. So, 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 uh, so, so let's turn uh, quasi-serious for a second. Um, in your book, Believer, uh, you open with a personal epiphany, your personal epiphany for politics. You were five years old, uh, and you went to see John F. Kennedy, uh, who was campaigning in your neighborhood on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 12 days before the 1960 election. And you wrote this, quote, Though I couldn't grasp the nuances, I somehow absorbed the larger message. We are the masters of our future, and politics is the means by which we shape it. So 55 years later, after that, that event in New York, do you still have your idealism for I politics? I thoroughly do. I thoroughly do. You've been through the wars. I have, but um, I, I, I mentioned earlier to a group that uh, I really wanted my book, I wanted the subtitle to be How My Idealism Survived 40 Years in Politics. But I've, you know, and I've seen politics at its worst, but I've also seen politics at its best. Um, look, you know, um, I, I will just, um, if, I, if I could just take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the healthcare thing, because I mentioned that I had a child who, um, who started seizing when she was seven months old. We thought she had died. We took her to the hospital. She, um, they told us it was probably a febrile thing, fever-related, and that she would be over in two days. They let, let us go a, a, a month later, and she was still having 10 seizures a day. And, um, and you know, I was at the Tribune at the time. I think I was making $38,000 a year. The our insurance that I had there, I think it was an HMO, didn't cover her medications, wouldn't allow for second opinions, even though they were talking about brain surgery at one point. And, um, and our out-of-pocket expenses were like $1,000 a month. Uh, and we were among those Americans who almost went bankrupt. So flat, uh, flash forward to March of 2009 when the president was trying to decide whether to do health care. I'm his political advisor and I know as a person, I know as a human being how desperately we needed reform because of my own experience. Um, but I also, my job was to talk about the politics and I said, you know, seven presidents had tried, seven presidents had failed. I knew how fraught the issue was uh, because I was very uh, fluent in the polling from the campaign and, and I really feared uh, taking on the issue and I, 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 I said that, you know, we were in the midst of the recession and so on. And uh, he said to me, um, yeah, but you know, if we don't do it now, it won't get done. And millions more people aren't going to have insurance. The system's going to implode eventually. Um, he said, what are we supposed to do? Put our approval rating on the shelf and admire it for uh, eight years? Are we supposed to draw down on it to do something important for the country? And each time we hit a pothole along the way, he was the guy who who said, no, we're going to keep going. I went into his office in the summer of 2009 with polling data, and it was pretty grim. And I wasn't trying to say we should stand down, because once he was in, I was in. I was so proud of him for, I, I would say I like him so much because he listened to me so little. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I ne he needed to know that we were taking on water, and I went through the whole thing. We were standing in the middle of the Oval Office. And he said, yeah, but I just got back from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I met a young woman who's 36 years old. She has two children, married, um, but now, and they have insurance, but she has stage four breast cancer now, and they've hit their lifetime cap, and she's terrified that she's gonna die and leave her family bankrupt, and he's leading me now. I feel his hand in the small of my back, <laughs> leading me out of his office, and we stop at the door, and he said, that's not the country we believe in, so let's keep 
fighting. And every time we hit, you know, th that thing almost died a thousand deaths. Um, a few weeks later, someone was trying to persuade him to throw in the towel, and he turned to his legislative director and said, uh, uh, Phil, what do you think the chances of passing this are? And, and his legislative director said, well, it depends how lucky you feel, Mr. President, which is not what you want to hear if you... <laughs> And uh, Obama just smiled and said, Phil, I'm a black guy named Barack Obama, and I'm president of the United States. <laughs> and he, said, he said, I feel lucky every day. <laughs> well, let's say. Uh, uh, but, but, but here's the point. Here's the point. Let me, th this, this is the point. On March, I think it was the 23rd of March, I'm not sure the exact date, 2010, we finally got to that point where this was passing in the House. And... Um, Everybody was in the, in, the, in the Roosevelt Room, which is the big conference room adjacent to the Oval Office. My office was right next to his office, and we were watching the final votes come in in the House. Everybody's excited. And I got up almost involuntarily and went into my office and shut the door, and I just broke down and cried. And I couldn't even, I didn't even fathom at first why I was so emotional about this. And then I realized it was because I knew that because of what we had done, there were families who wouldn't go through what my family had gone through. And I went and I found the president and I said, um, and I said that, I said, thank you for this because on, on behalf of all the families who won't have to go through what my family went through. And he, knows the whole, he knew the whole story because he's an old friend of mine. And uh, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, that's why we do the work. And I will never forget that exchange because, in a sense, it summarizes everything for me. Uh, this is, there's real meaning to this. It's not just about whether the blue team wins or the red team wins or someone's ambitions are fulfilled. It's about what we can do to make this a better country, help people, uh, build a better future. And now I bump into people on the street. I had a young man come up to me a few weeks ago with a baseball cap on, no hair tears in his eyes, and he said, I think you saved my life. I said, what are you talking about? He said, uh, I didn't have health insurance. I got it under the Affordable Care Act. I, I wasn't feeling well, and I went to the doctor, which I wouldn't have done, and it turns out I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I've gotten the treatment I need, and now they say I'm going to live. And he was just completely overcome. How can you not be an idealist when you have those kind of experiences? Well, uh, let's talk a little bit more about Barack Obama. And I, I know you now run a nonpartisan institute, but I also so I've kind know, of dropped my hand here, I think. Yeah, uh, but but uh, <laughs> but uh, you probably, with the exception of Michelle, probably know him better than anybody in the country. So I, I, I'll go back to a scene. It was 2004. I was editor of the Baltimore Sun at the time, and I bumped into you at a reception before the White House correspondence dinner. And uh, uh, a young Barack Obama was running for the U.S. Senate. And you, I don't know if you remember this, you pulled me aside and said, this guy's really special. Uh, and then you were kind enough to take me over to, introdu to uh, introduce me to him. But what, what did you view as special about Barack Obama? Well, you know, I met him in 1992. I got a call from a friend of mine named Betty Lou Saltzman, who's kind of a doyen of liberal politics in Chicago and a great friend of mine and she said, I just met the most remarkable young man and I think you ought to meet him. And I said, I'm happy to meet anybody you want me to meet, but why? And she said, um, because I think he could be the first African American president of the United States. So I always take her to the track with me now when I, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, and so I did sit down with him and uh, we had lunch and uh, I didn't go, I didn't, as I wrote, I didn't leave, uh, you know, humming hail to the chief. But uh, what was very clear was, um, you know, the world of politics does, divides into two categories. And the, the larger category is people who run for office because they want to be something. And then there's a smaller and more admirable cohort of people who run for public office because they want to do something. They want to make a difference. And here was a guy who had been president of the Harvard Law Review, could have written his ticket at any corporation or law firm in America, and instead he came back to Chicago to lead a voter registration drive and to practice employment and civil rights law at a small law firm there. And, um, and it was clear, to, and he talked about his desire to do public service. It's very clear that he saw it as a calling, that he saw it as a way of making a big difference for, for communities and for people. And, um, and so I walked away from that meeting really feeling that way. But then we went through the 
you know, in that year, uh, 2004, we went through this extraordinary race that was really the precursor of the presidential race. He started off like he was nowhere, you know, when he uh, called me and said he wanted to run. And um, I actually was at sort of a crossroads in my life because um, I had another client in Illinois whose name you guys will probably remember, named Rod Blagojevich. <laughs> and I think, I think it says a lot of, about me that I volunteered that. <laughs> but I had helped him run for the Congress. You know, he was a legislator, and I, I liked him. He was, you know, he had a good working class sensibility, and uh, he was pugnacious, and I liked him. But when he came to me in 2001 and said he wanted to run for governor, I was a little frightened. And I said, well, why do you want to run for governor? And he said, well, you can help me with that. You can help me figure that out. And I said, look, if I have to help you figure out, then you shouldn't run. And that was the end of our relationship. But by 2002, he was, he had hired another firm. They were doing a state-of-the-art campaign. He ran as a reformer because the last governor was also headed to prison, as you remember. I think, I think three of the last five Illinois governors have gone to prison. It's a, it's yes. a, it's a, it's a distinguished or record. We prefer to refer, we refer to it as they are uh, away at the request of the federal government <laughs> on assignment from the federal government. But, um, but, uh, so, um, but I was very depressed because it was clear to me that Blagojevich was going to win this governor's race running a very state-of-the-art and very cynical campaign. And I wondered whether I just didn't have it to be in this business anymore. And then Obama called me and said he wanted to run for the Senate. And there were other guys, uh, people who had called. There was a Republican in that seat, but they ended up not run he ended up not running. There were other people running who were, who were good people, statewide office holder with good name recognition and another guy who was going to spend a lot of his own money. Um, but I told my wife, Susan, that if I could help Barack get elected to the Senate, I would have felt, I, f I would feel like I had done something really um, valuable. And he, it was a, the campaign was a revelation uh, to me in 2000, in the fall of 2002, when we first started working together, they were voting on the resolution, in Iraq resolution. And we got a call from the same Betty Lou Saltzman asking him to speak at an anti-war rally. And we had a little discussion, his small little group of advisors. Some of them felt he, it was too risky because even the Democrats who were running supported the resolution. It was quite popular at the time. And he said, yeah, but I just don't believe this is smart. I don't think it's the right thing to do. So he went to the rally. He wrote this speech. And if you go back, you can find it on Google now. If you go back and look at it, it was the most prescient critique of why we shouldn't go into Iraq. He talked about, you know, I fear a war of undetermined cost, undetermined length, and undetermined consequences. I fear we're going to unleash sectarian strife that we can't control. I think we're going to make America a bigger fulcrum for terror. All of those things came true, and we're still dealing with it today. But he was a state senator from Illinois. He had no foreign policy staff in the state senate. Uh, and, you know, this was something that he arrived at uh, on his own. The second thing I learned about him when he was running was, um, for the Senate, was he would go down to, like one day he went down to deep southern Illinois, closer to uh, Little Rock than Chicago, and he would, visited a veterans, uh, a VFW hall, and I got a call from the kid who was with him, saying, gee, we got a great reception. And I was, like, surprised. And he called that night, and I told him I was surprised. And he said, why are you so surprised? I said, man, a black guy named Barack Obama, deep southern Illinois. I thought it could be challenging. He said, you don't get it. Um, these people were like my grandparents from Kansas. He said, night we talk about my grandfather marching in Patton's army and my, my grandmother, who was a Rosie the Riveter. And uh, we have a good time. And I realized this guy was comfortable in any, in any room he walked into, whether it was that VFW hall, an inner city church, Tony Parlor in the suburbs. And to be able to cross those lines was an extraordinary gift. And then the third thing was, of course, the Democratic Convention, right. that incredible speech that he, that he wrote. Um, so, you know, it, over time I began to realize this guy was something really, really special. Uh, a couple more questions and then I'm going to open it up for your questions. It would help if I didn't fill about No, 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 this, this is all, this is interesting stuff. Um, let, let's talk for a second about how history may regard Barack Obama. Um, in your book, you describe a scene near the end of the 2008 campaign, and candidate Obama looked out the window of his RV at his, this sea of campaign supporters, and he turns and says to you, quote, 
You know, we may be the victims of our own success. The expectations are so high, it's going to be really hard to meet them. Yeah. Did President Obama meet expectations? Do you think well, those expectations, say, those expectations um, as he said, were almost impossible to meet, in part because, I mean, when he said that, we already had a sense that we were heading into a deep financial crisis. None of us knew how deep. We, we had a meeting in mid-December of 2016 in which they presented, you know, like one by one, his economic advisors presented the picture, you know, uh, deepest recession since the Great Depression could be the next it, one in three chance of a Great Depression, banking system locked up could collapse, trillions of uh, millions of jobs going to be lost, trillions more to the debt. You know, they delivered this. None of us were thinking about this in Grant Park, you know, that night. <laughs> they delivered this. Everybody's looking at Obama, wondering how he's going to react. And he said, well, he said, I guess it's too late to ask for a recount. <laughs> so we'd better figure out what to do. And, um, and that's where, the, in that room, in the next four hours, the Recovery Act was, the concept of the Recovery Act was really uh, hashed out uh, in its broadest uh, terms. I think that history, so no, he, he did, electing Barack Obama did not, was not a panacea for all that ailed America. Um, and, uh, and obviously, we didn't, we weren't able to heal the divisions that, we wanted to uh, heal. Uh, but we came to office in a much different circumstance than we ever anticipated because of the financial crisis. He had to make a series of decisions, each of which were as unpopular as they were necessary. The Recovery Act, standing up the financial industry, saving the American auto industry, um, that were very difficult. He elected to do health reform, which I admire him for, very, very uh, difficult. The Republicans made a strategic decision not to play, that made it very uh, difficult. And you know, there's another element of this, there's another overlay, which was, you know, we, we had two wars raging and an ongoing terrorism threat, and we should note even as we sit here, some of you may have seen on your, uh, on your devices, that uh, there was a horrendous terrorist attack in Paris tonight, 100 people or more killed, and uh, so we live with this, uh, and the world lives with us to this day. The night before the inauguration, I got a call from Rahm Emanuel, who was the incoming chief of staff, and he said, give me uh, a call, and I called him, and he, uh, he said, There's, uh, I've been with the Bush people all day, there's a credible threat on the inauguration, we think there could be an attack, and I, you know, I can't read anybody else in, you've got to write a 60 second set of remarks for the president, and if, uh, if the Secret Service taps him on the shoulder, he'll go up and disperse the crowd. And um, I stayed up the night before we took office, couldn't sleep, I heard sirens in the night. My wife and son were staying with me. And I heard sirens in the night and all night I was thinking, could this be it, could this be what they were talking about? And in the morning, my wife and my son were, one of my sons were going to the uh, church services with the Obamas and the Bushes, the traditional church service before the inaugural, and I was going off to do TV, and all I wanted to do was tell them not to go. I, I just, I, I, I was so frightened that something would happen there, and I would have to live with that for the rest of my life, that I could have saved my family and didn't do it, uh, and luckily that didn't come to pass, but, um, you know, you run for office, and you have a lot of ambitions, and then you come to office, and you're faced with a lot of very, very dramatic challenges, and um, it makes it hard to deliver on everything. That said, I think history will be good to Barack Obama. He did lead us through that crisis, um, and he, he, he made these decisions unflinchingly, um, and uh, he, he did, we still have obviously issues in the Middle East, but we had 180,000 troops, you know, uh, in play uh, when he, took office, um, you know, um, uh, we, we, we went through financial reform. We, I think gay and lesbian Americans face a different set of circumstances today than when we uh, took office. And I could go through a whole list of things that are fundamental change. Obviously, health reform would be at the, uh, right at the top um, that he delivered on despite all the obstacles that we face. And then there's one other thing, which is, um, 
you know, there are millions of Americans uh, uh, who look at them, who can look at themselves differently today because um, Barack Obama broke a barrier that many people thought would never be broken. So, uh, yeah, I think history is going to be good to him. Uh, before I turn to your questions, one more uh, question for you. Point, Pointer is a media organization. You will um, go down in history as, as one of the great uh, political uh, strategists and messengers. Um, what do you think is the impact of social media and new media today uh, on politics uh, and on the public discourse? Well, enormous. You know, I think one of the issues we face is that this change is happening so rapidly we can't even get our arms around it and understand it uh, completely. But just as um, uh, social media has uh, really challenged and changed journalism, it's challenged and changed politics in some ways for the better and in some ways uh, for the worse. Um, I, don't, I, I can say without question that Barack Obama wouldn't be president of the United States today without social media, without the power of the internet. We were, you know, when we started off that campaign, um, there were eight of us in a room. That was the entire national Obama for president organization. And two of them were Michelle and Barack. <laughs> so, uh, so we, you know, and the reason we were able to, uh, we had a faith that there were millions of people out there who agreed with us that we needed some fundamental change, and, uh, and those people answered the call. But it was social media that allowed us to do that. On the other hand, just as with, uh, you know, the, the social media gives people access to lots of information, but it also, um, I think, shuts down in many ways that period of introspection that you would like to see in journalism, in politics. Everything is immediate. You have to react to everything. When you build a campaign now, you have dozens of people monitoring social media. And you have to be prepared to react and respond immediately to things that you see on social media, offensively and defensively. Um, and, it can, and it can capture and take over campaigns for days at a time. And um, so, you know, um, it also is going to, it changes the way the combination of big data and what we can learn about voters and um, the fact that we all now carry these things around and we can contact people directly is going to change the way campaigns work. And, you know, everybody's going to start getting customized messages. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's profound. And I don't pretend to understand all of the implications of it. All I know is that I feel a little bit like we're careening and we're careening forward, but it's not all good, and we're not sure exactly, you know, what all the implications are. Right. Right. Interesting. So, uh, if if you have a question, we have microphones uh, to take to you. While the microphone, I'm gonna, I, I lied. I'm gonna ask one more question while we're getting to the mics. Um, is Donald J. Trump going to be the next president of the United States? <laughs> Despite his generosity to Citizens United for Research and Epilepsy. Um, no, I don't think he's going to be President of the United States. I think, though, and I, th and I think anyone who saw his, uh, his exhibition last night will, uh, will probably understand why. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it is too facile to just dismiss Trump as a kind of carnival barker. Um, although it is interesting that he cites as his childhood hero, and this is an absolutely true fact, Flo Ziegfeld, the impresario behind the Ziegfeld Follies. That is what he said. When he grew up, he was his, he was his um, role model. And, I, and, in certain, and that's how he views this whole exercise. He's like a, he's a impresario, he's an entertainer, he's, a, and, but um, I never thought that his psyche would permit him to participate in a process where he might not win or where his popularity was put up for a vote. I think the reason he was so irritable last night was because it was beginning to dawn on him that he could lose, that he could, you know, not just not finish first, but maybe not even finish second. And I don't think that, that, that he, that his constitution allows for that. So I think it's, more, it, it's far more likely that he will never appear on the ballot than it is that 
or that he will never be an active candidate in the campaign, then it'll be that, he, that, that, that he'll be president. The other last thing I'll say about it is um, he is speaking to something primal in our politics right now. The single biggest thing that courses through our politics are the changes that technology and globalization have wrought in our economy. And there are millions and millions of Americans who uh, have seen uh, m m their jobs um, uh, go away because of these changes. Many of them are non-college educated uh, people. Uh, wages are basically uh, flat for 90% of Americans in, uh, in the last 22 years. The median income is the same as it was in 1999. And there's a real anger out there. Uh, and his base are sort of white, non-college educated men. And he speaks to them and his anti, his nativist, anti-immigrant, anti-trade uh, rhetoric really hits home with them. No one should underestimate that. It's not just that he's entertaining. He's also very exploitative of something that's real out there. Good point. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Rosemary. I'm Rosemary O'Hara. I'm the editorial page editor of The Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, my question is, as somebody who was in the media and went into an administration that captured America's attention, why is the administration so secretive? For those of us in the media, it's a huge disappointment how difficult it is to get information out of the government. And some of us had hoped the Obama administration would turn the leaf and become more transparent. And yet the Obama administration is as bad or as worse as any administration. Why does the federal government make it so difficult to answer, to answer questions or to find out information? Well, let me say, I, I think in many, uh, as an objective matter, there's more information available now, accessible uh, from the federal government and about the federal government online than uh, has ever been true before. And that is an affirmative uh, uh, commitment on the part of the administration. But um, it's also true that particularly in matters that uh, relate to national security, um, there's been a very um, uh, strong commitment to try and stop uh, leaks. And a lot of the, I think a lot of the cases that have graded uh, uh, the most on people are, were those national security uh, cases. And um, I, my predilection, my bias is in favor of more rather than less because I do come out of the news media. On the other hand, I had um, security clearance. I was very cognizant of, you know, some of the threats and some of the things that were, we were trying to deal with and, um, and some of the risks associated with some of the leaks that were, uh, that, 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 that occurred in terms of trying to uh, interdict the kinds of incidents that we saw in Paris tonight. And it's a very tough balancing act. I mean, a similar thing was, um, you know, uh, I, I sat in a meeting with the president and a bunch of civil libertarians, many of whom he knew as colleagues uh, when he was a law professor, uh, talking about uh, Guantanamo and how uh, he was going to deal with or was dealing with uh, prisoners there. And, you know, at one point, and I wrote this in the book, you know, it was a very good conversation, a very uh, uh, passionate conversation. And at one point he said, uh, you know, you're doing exactly what you should be doing. These people deserve your representation. I'm the president of the United States and I have to represent the entire uh, country. And the question is, if, if we just release these people and something happens, um, how much can a democracy take? And that's what a president has to deal with. So I'm not, you, you're doing what you should be doing. You should be uh, a fervent advocate for um, as much disclosure as you can possibly get. And, and I think democracy demands that too. Uh, but I'm just telling you that uh, it's a very difficult balance that you have to strike and um, uh, I think I was heartened by the end of uh, uh, Eric Holder's term that uh, there was a, uh, a rethinking of some of the approach uh, to uh, uh, 
to media shields and so on uh, from uh, from the beginning of the administration. But um, I'm not here to excuse um, the things that uh, concern you, but I'm, I am here to tell you that it's it's more complex. It's it's less black and white than it may seem uh, at the editorial desk than it is when you're sitting in the Oval Office and dealing what, with what's spread across his desk. I saw some other hands up. We'll uh, get the microphone to you. So good to have you here in St. Pete. Thank you. Um, I've sort of been a political junkie since 1972 when my parents were volunteering for the George McGovern campaign down in Texas. And I have to say that of all the campaigns I've followed over the years with a lot of interest, the 2008 campaign of Barack Obama, particularly running for the um, nomination, was the most exciting politics I've ever seen. It was a little really, too exciting at times for me. It was. It was one for the ages. <laughs> and the speeches after each, uh, each victory or loss were just fantastic. But, you know, interestingly enough, after all of that and all the bruising from between him and Hillary Clinton, um, President Obama selected Hillary Clinton for Secretary of State. And, and I know that his, his wife must have really been upset with Hillary by the time the, that campaign was over. I was just kind of curious if you could add some insight on how much you were involved in discussions on the selection of Hillary and also Rahm Emanuel. Uh, for, uh, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the process that took place to get those folks. Well, I'll let there, let's take them one at a time. Rahm, you know, I was, yeah, I was involved in both those things. Uh, in, in Rahm's case, um, we were talking about early on, while the election was still going on and it became clear that we were probably going to win, that he needed somebody who could navigate. We, we were going to have such a array of challenges to deal with that he needed someone who could navigate Washington and who understood how the White House works. Rahm had spent seven years in the White House. He was a leader in the Congress. Uh, he knew the president well from Chicago. They had been friends. And so he was sort of an obvious choice. And uh, I, um, I was the one who was the president. Call him and feel him out. So uh, I call him, and he immediately, in his own delicate way, started screaming at me <laughs> and said, no freaking way. And freaking wasn't the word he used. And he says, you tell him not to call me. Tell him not to call me. He says, I don't want to do this. This is bad for me. It's bad for my family. And he just went on a rant. So I went back to Obama and said, I think he'll do it. Give him a call. <laughs> because I knew, I knew Rahm well enough to know that if the President of the United States called him and asked him to do it, that he wouldn't, he wouldn't say no. Uh, in, in the case of Hillary, um, you know, I was, I, there were times after we won the nomination where he talked about, you know, sort of idly, you know, she'd be an interesting Supreme Court choice. She'd be, but then after the um, election, he he basically told us. He said, "I think I'm going to ask Hillary to be Secretary of State." And um, you know, I was kind of taken aback just because we had gone through this two-year marathon with her, and I said, "Well, how's that? You know, how's that going to work?" And his basic thing was, first of all, we were friends before that election. We'll be friends after that election. But he said, I know her, and, I, and if she's on the team, I think she'll be a, a loyal, productive member of the team. And, and here was his reasoning. He said, I am going to have to deal with this economic crisis. And that's going to take up a lot of time in the short run. We have all these other challenges in the world. And I need someone who's going to arrive in these foreign uh, ports, as it were, uh, who people immediately recognize as sort of the A team, and uh, and she and she can do that, and that's that was his reasoning behind. And I will say, in the two years I was there, they had an incredibly respectful relationship. They worked very very well. If 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 anyone was looking for you know sort of signs of friction as a result of what they the campaign they'd run, they they really weren't there. Now on the staff level, there was still some friction. And you could see that bubble up from time to time. But the principles really got along very well. OK. Uh, do we have a question in the back? Here? Yeah. yeah. This guy doesn't sound like he needs a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And thanks 
sure you're here with quite a lot. Thank you. Uh, my question, to what extent do you think uh, uh, racism uh, played an important part in both the obstruction and the venom uh, that uh, President Obama has had to deal with for the last uh, seven plus years? I don't know, it feels like you have a view on this. <laughs> Um, you know, I have to confess that um, throughout the time that I worked for him, both in the White House and during the campaign, I always resisted this question. And I resisted it because I didn't want anybody to say that we were making an alibi for whatever they viewed as our failures. I, I, and I knew that they would. Um, but when I was writing my book, I, I, I just had to acknowledge the reality, which was, um, I think that, uh, you know, there's no other president who's had his citizenship persistently questioned against all reason. There's no other president who had a member of Congress stand up in the House chamber and, and accuse him of lying um, in a way that was incredibly disrespectful. Um, so, you know, yes, is, and, and, and I do think that there are segments of this country, and you saw them at the Sarah Palin rallies in 2008, the same kind of nativist cohort that we've, uh, we've seen, uh, we see around the Trump group, uh, who uh, fundamentally were unaccepting of him, in part because he represented the change that was happening. You know, we are becoming a much more diverse country. And that's an inexorable pattern. And I think it's for the better. I'm the son of an immigrant. I think that that's one of the great strengths of our country. But, um, uh, but that's not the way this group of folks f feel. And to them, Barack Obama is symbolic of all of that. And uh, so, um, yes, do I think that race has had something uh, to do? And there are people, there's no doubt there are people in the Congress who, you know, I, I sat in on meetings where they treated him in ways that I don't think they would have treated uh, another president. Not the majority of them, but, but, uh, but some of them. And uh, so that, that was part of the impediment. But I don't want to say that that was the whole story. The truth is, when we got elected, we won a massive majority in the House and, uh, and a big majority in the Senate. That was after 2006 when Democrats also won. The Republican Party was flat on its back when we won the election in 2008. And they, they felt they were facing extinction. And their strategy from the beginning, and Mitch McConnell's been very blunt about this, was they, were gonna let, they knew we had big problems and they were going to let us wrestle with them ourselves because they knew that they had a better chance of winning in 2010 uh, if uh, they had no authorship of the very difficult things that the president was going to have to do to deal with the crisis. And they also knew that it was going to take more than a year or two for the recovery, uh, to the recovery to take hold. So their best opportunity to win seats back in 2010 was to be stubbornly resistant to everything. Um, so that goes beyond the race question. That's just, hard, you asked about hardball, po that was hardball politics. And I think it was reprehensible because the country was at a time of emergency. You know, just four months before the, um, or three months before we took office, uh, the president was, at, uh, Senator Obama was asked in the middle of his campaign for the election to uh, help provide the votes to pass a bill to bail out the financial industry at a time when America was absolutely enraged about what the financial industry had done. And he, in conjunction with Nancy Pelosi, uh, Harry Reid, they provided votes uh, that were necessary, particularly in the House, that, you know, provided the votes that were necessary to pass uh, that program and work with Bush to pass that program. Why? Because he felt, Pelosi felt, that it was their responsibility as leaders to do this for the country, even though it was distasteful, uh, that the alternative was unthinkable. I didn't see that spirit on the other side when we came to office and faced the worst recession since the Great Depression and had to take steps to deal with it. And I find that really regrettable. Yes, back here. 
Yes. Go ahead. When I was a young man, uh, Howard Baker oh. and uh, Tip O'Neill uh, seemed like they were really doing what was in the best interests of the country. Since then, obviously, the dynamics have changed a lot in the leadership of those houses. Uh, what's your opinion on the extra impediments in dealing with the White House and the administration with these different dynamics we have these days? Well, our politics are different. I mean, we, we are much more um, polarized right now. Um, part of it has to do with the way we choose representatives to Congress. There are, you know, what, 30 uh, competitive districts in the whole country, and then everybody else just has to worry about a primary uh, in their own party. So Democrats have to look over their left shoulder. Republicans have to look over their right shoulder. And the, the system of rewards is out of whack. Like, you don't get rewarded for compromise uh, within your own party. Um, and, you know, the most strident voices in the Republican Party uh, consider cooperation treason. And there are people on our own side who, you know, don't like the idea. We, we took plenty of hits, you know, for any deal that we made with any compromise with uh, the Republicans. So the st it's structurally very difficult now, and it's a, a, that is abetted and, and uh, exacerbated by the fact that we're sorting ourselves much more as Americans into cities and rural areas, and it's hard to draw. Um, it's hard to draw competitive districts. It would be much better if every representative had to appeal to Republicans and Democrats uh, in order to get elected. Um, so times are uh, are different. And then you add, uh, you mentioned social media and cable television and. Um, you know, you have people basically choosing media outlets to their own, uh, that affirm their own views instead of everybody listening to the same conversation. And um, that adds to it. And then the third thing that adds to it is this incredible uh, infusion of money into the political process. Uh, and you have, you know, unlimited amounts of money, a permanent campaign uh, aimed at, uh, and mostly at the present, but you know some the other way, and all this is a, a prescription for the kind of uh, gridlock and ugliness that we've seen. And you know, I, I wish I had a ready answer for it. You know, I know we've had bitter, and you know, we've had times in this country where, after all, people have been caned by a, one legislator caning another in the Senate, and you know, we've had uh, sitting vice presidents killing. Uh, former Treasury secretaries and, um, you know, we've had a few problems before. Um, but, you know, this is, we got to work our way through this um, and we've got to demand something better because um, it's, uh, it's really an unhealthy environment. And what it does is basically you, 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 you have to settle for the least, the, the smallest compromises. You, you, it's hard to do anything big and, you know, there are, problems that demand long-term answers that we just never get to because it's too difficult in this environment to, to get to them. So um, it's not just the personalities. I, I will say one thing about the personalities, though. Um, we also lost something. You know, in World War II, everyone fought side by side, Republicans and Democrats in urban and rural. And, um, and so you had people serving in Congress who uh, May, may have had bitter disagreements, but also had the experience of having served in the military together. Um, and, uh, the, you know, there are famous stories about Bob Dole and Dan Inouye, uh, who rehabbed together from grievous war injuries for a year. And um, my friend Steve Schmidt likes to tell this story about uh, when Dan Inouye died, uh, Bob Dole was wheeled in in his wheelchair, and he stood up. Um, he got out of his wheelchair and he walked the last few steps and he saluted and he said afterwards, Danny wouldn't have wanted to see me in a wheelchair. Um, so, you know, we've lost that sense of, of commonality. We've got to find that again. We've got to find a way to disagree um, and still recognize that we all love the country and that we all, um, you know, that we all have a common stake. Right. 
yes, we have a woman over there who's been trying to get a question. Yeah. Yes, um, hi. Against the backdrop of the terrorist um, activity that was unleashed on Paris today and that continues unabated, I'm just wondering, what do you think is the U.S.'s role in the war um, against ISIS in Syria and uh, the Middle East? And as an outgoing president, um, with the clock ticking, is President Obama's limited but continuing action in the Middle East um, going too far without war powers? Um, and speak to boots on the ground versus no boots on the ground. Um, well, look, uh, well, the one thing, here's what I've learned um, about, um, uh, you know, and I don't pretend to be a, an expert on national security, and I'm not here posing uh, as one, but I, did, I was close enough to all of it to learn a few things. One is, and we saw another example of it today, um, there really is risk here that has to be addressed. Um, there are people who are really who really are intent on uh, harming Americans and harming others in w uh, Westerners and so on. I mean that that is that is real and it can't be ignored. It has to be uh, addressed. Um, uh, I've also learned that uh, the most uh, the the question that's not nearly asked enough in in, in foreign policy and these military decisions is what next. If we do this, what comes next? Uh, if we had asked that question in Iraq, as Obama asked those questions or raised them before we went into Iraq, I, I don't think we would have gone into Iraq uh, because all the things that he predicted uh, came true. Um, I, I think that um, he w what he's trying to do um, is provide enough support that um, indigenous forces there can, uh, can repel uh, ISIS. I heard, you know, Trump say he'd bomb the shit out of them. Um, elegant phrase. Uh, Sounds like Trump. Yes. Yeah. But he, uh, but, um, you know, I, I had this experience just recently. Uh, someone was doing a project on uh, recruitment videos and martyr videos that are being used to recruit people to uh, ISIS, and what was striking to me was I, I expected them to be much more fanatical, but the story they told was of, you know, we're being occupied, we're, we've been invaded, our kids are being killed, our wives and children, you know, our families are being uh, killed, and we have to repel this. Um, and you can see that how that story could take root. The reason I raise it is because um, projecting American troops into these situations is a very mixed bag because uh, the terrorists like nothing better than to make this a war against Westerners, against Americans, uh, and to make America the fulcrum uh, of this. So, uh, you know, I think the president has been rightly reticent about uh, uh, on these decisions. On the other hand, you have to, you know, I'm sure his thinking is you have to commit enough people to make what you are doing as effective as you can make it. Um, you know, but it's a, it's a very, very difficult quagmire. Um, and um, I don't think there are easy, uh, easy answers to it. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I don't want to, um, I'm just not going to answer the war powers thing in detail. It's obviously a very um, significant debate, um, and uh, I, you know, uh, I think that we've, in many ways, uh, rendered um, congressional participation almost meaningless uh, because we've given broad parameters to presidents. I, and I have great confidence in this president. I don't know about the next president. Uh, you know, and this is a discussion, a debate we should have. Tim Kaine, who's a good friend of mine, who's a great senator from uh, Virginia, has been a great ally of the president's, has been very strong on trying to restore the War Powers Act. And I, I think it's a, a worthy debate. 
So that's, now that was elegant, what I just did. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm afraid that's going to have to be our last question, but, but um, I want to thank all of you uh, so much. I especially, David, want to thank you wow. for thank uh, you. coming to St. Pete. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me.